Two-minute introductions, very concise. Before you were doing autonomous driving, school, and what, were you, what was the thesis, and where, what you're doing now at your companies. Go, Oscar. All right, hello, everyone. So, um, so I did my PhD at uh, UC San Diego. I actually worked on automating the analysis of, of coral reefs. So launched a site that is used all over the world now for, by coral reef uh, researchers. I then did a brief postdoc at uh, Berkeley uh, with Trevor Darrell. I wanted to immerse myself in, in the latest research on deep learning. Um, and I now head up a machine learning group at Newtonomy. So we're based in uh, Santa Monica in Los Angeles. Fantastic. James. Uh, yes, I'm James Philbin. So uh, I did my PhD at Oxford in the UK. Um, my thesis was on uh, basically uh, textured image search. So you could find, you know, you could select an image of the Eiffel Tower and you'd find from a very large data set all other images of that, that object. So after my PhD, I co-founded a startup that sort of commercialized that technology. It was called Plink. Um, and we focused on art search for sort of museums. That was uh, acquired by Google in 2010, I think now. And um, uh, so then I went to work for Google. Uh, by the time I left Google, I was running a team, uh, actually also in Santa Monica. And um, then in 2015, I decided to leave Google and uh, start a vision team at Zoox. So Zoox is a, um, for those who don't know, it's a, a startup focused on uh, building a sort of ground up um, autonomous ride sharing service. So the idea is something like an Uber, you'll pull out your phone, you'll call a Zoox, and actually our robot will, will pull up and take you where, where you want to go. Uh, and I'm Saad, uh, I did my PhD in France, uh, then uh, postdoc at MIT. Uh, my PhD and my postdoc was mostly about like marine environment autonomy. Uh, how do you have like uh, as many vehicles co autonomously collaborate together? Um, since, and uh, early this year, I joined Sea Machines, uh, and I'm heading in the AI research and autonomous driving there. So once again, more uh, uh, ex research experts, and some earlier today that have been professors and associate professors, including you guys, and now in the entrepreneurial world. I'd love to start off, before we get into the discussion of computer vision and autonomous cars, you know, because we love empowering, inspiring, and finding, people exactly like you guys and, and women and, and the community to jump if and when they want. How did you decide, and we've talked about this actually in the past, you know, to uh, jump into the entrepreneurial side? Like, was there one thing that helped you make that decision rather than staying in the research? Not that research and university is bad, just because of the choice. Who wants to kick off what was the one thing that kind of jumped you into a startup? James, how about kicking it off? Um, yeah. I, I, I couldn't give you a very good uh, sort of cogent answer. I think, you know, I got to the end of my PhD. Um, I didn't have a very good idea what I wanted to do. And, um, you know, I enjoyed what I was doing at Oxford and I actually thought it had sort of commercial potential. Um, and so, yeah, that was, that, that's, about, that's about the size of it. So, um, so it was just kind of it happened that you were intrigued that you thought it had commercial potential. But how did you know that? Like, so I think no, I know there's many researchers and students that say, well, I don't know, or when, or it's not ready yet, or, you know, so how did you, what was the gut? I mean, I think you have a sort of naivety when you're a, a student, right, that sort of, you don't think of all the downsides, you just think, oh, this is, you know, I think Ira was uh, giving some, some great demo of this earlier, right, you, you see your technology, you think, oh, it's cool, everyone's going to love it, and um, you just go for it, and actually, you know, you kind of need that leap of faith um, to, uh, to sort of, yeah, go and start a business, and then, of course, you realize how hard it is, and <laughs> maybe it wasn't such a good idea after all, but... <laughs> <laughs> you have regrets? No, no regrets. Okay, good. <laughs> Oscar. Well, so for me, the choice of staying in or leaving academia was, was fairly easy. I, I don't know. I always consider myself an engineer. I love building things. And I find in academia, sometimes to do research and make progress, you have to sort of limit the scope of... You have to really set strict, um, a strict kind of fixed box of, of the problem you're looking at. So you have to restrict the data set, the assumptions, because you don't have the resources to take a full approach to the problem. You do that in your personal life? You put the box around it and you figure out where you're sitting <laughs> in the box? Well, I think when, you, when you're publishing a paper, you have to say, this right. is the assumptions I'm going to make and this is, this is the space I'm going to operate in. Um, while in business, it's just you have a problem and everything is on the table, right? So you can pull in any sort of, you can cheat any way you like, right? And I'm just, uh, to me, that's really appealing. Great. Yeah. So, uh, Saad, you're at Sea Machine. So, uh, caveat, I'm an investor in Sea Machines, but that doesn't mean I'm going to take it easy on Saad. So just to put it out there, All go. Right. Thank you. 
So um, me, you know, I think it's a little bit different because I um, I was born and raised in Morocco. Um, it's it's a different environment. So you know, there's there's a lot of entrepreneurship because like basically uh, no one else can do anything for you unless you do it yourself. Uh, so I went to France to study with this idea to start a business, uh, but then quickly I realized, well, that's that's probably not going to happen uh, for me there. The environment is not ready. Um, but and my father like pushed me because like he he's like, okay, you know, you want to do something by yourself, do it. And uh, but then he pushed me like, why don't you like follow up on a PhD? That's going to make you more expert in whatever you want to do. Uh, and uh, it, it was great because like, you know, with the PhD, you know, comes like then, you know, you can explore the world more deeply, you understand better the, the problems. But then you realize, you know, academia is not, uh, is, is, it provides you like a lot of freedom, but it's not like the total freedom that you get with entrepreneurship, which is like, I think, why entrepreneurship is the best thing to, to be doing. All right. Um, so just for perspective at each of your companies, when you started and now, how many people on your computer vision team? Um, and, and, and so when you started, when was it, and how many people, and, and now, really quickly? So we were two when I started, and we're about six now. When was that? In September last year. James? Um, yeah, so there's sort of me and two other people, and now 15. 15? Yeah. OK. Well, it's still me and one intern. <laughs> Just to give you size and scale of different companies um, for perspective. So let's start with what's, a, we've seen uh, many sessions today already talk about the challenges and opportunities uh, for auto, uh, uh, autonomous vehicles to see. And vehicles here, obviously we're talking about cars, but we're also talking about boats with sea machines. Um, what's the number one technology channel, challenge uh, that you think is uh, the most difficult to solve today, and when will it be solved? Can I answer with three? Sure. Can I give you three? Absolutely. That's what I initially <laughs> so, asked you, so you probably did your research. Yeah. <laughs> you did your homework. Good man. I did. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think, um, I mean, I think we have a lot of sort of pragmatic, but very difficult, but very solvable engineering problem set of us in the short term. Mm -hmm. So one is, for example, you know, we know, I so said there was some discussion about that earlier, but I think most of us would agree that you need a lighter, you need a camera, and they complement each other beautifully. But how do you actually do that in practice is, is quite tricky. So if you're moving, if the eager vehicle is moving quickly, you may be going around a the corner, there's other vehicles going, um, going around uh, the environment as well. Um, you need to think really carefully about sense of fusion and sensor synchronization. So you have things going at you know, 20 hertz, 50 hertz, and everything needs to be timed down to the microsecond. And how do you then set up your sensor fusion algorithm? Um, so I think that's it's very solvable, but it's, it's a challenging engineering problem. When do you think it'll be solvable in a commodity? Well, I think uh, I have good hope that um, you know, within the next one or two years, that's going to be. Um, I mean, I hope we have solved it in a few months, but you know, everyone else will. Needs more time, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> James, <laughs> excellent. Why don't we do rotate? Uh, we'll do one from each of you guys. So go, James, what's yours? Um, yeah, so I, I think sort of grappling with the long tail um, set of events is super important for, for self-driving. Like I think as a community, we typically in papers sort of focus on the average case. Um, and that's sort of just not good enough. Um, when you're driving a vehicle, you, you think about how far you know, the average human can drive something like 100,000 miles between an accident. Um, so just think how many times you need to see an obstacle and not make an error uh, for that to be true. It's, it's mind-boggling, right? And, and so that's what we need to do um, as a community is actually focus on, you know, not just good average case behavior, but sort of minimizing the, the gross errors that can actually lead to accidents. And I think that's a, that's a huge challenge because I, th I don't think people have been focusing very much on it. Um, and I also think that's a driver of, uh, you know, as Oscar was saying, needing multiple modalities. You know, I, I would include radar in that mix as well. Um, and also the map, actually. So I, th I think the map, you can see it as another modality. Um, it's, it's another way of seeing the world. I mean, it has its own pros and cons. Um, so is there, are those, uh, those edge cases or the long tail, as you're saying, is that 90%? Is that 10%? Is, is that the 1% where the most accidents going to happen? Well, I mean, you know, that's the whole 80-20 or rule of what do we focus on when we can. So Right. Yeah, so it, it's sort of the one percent, but the, but they occur sort of ninety nine percent of the time, something like that. It's right? the so one percent <laughs> that occurs ninety nine percent of so the you, time. So you see, you know, they're, they're sort of one off things that you see very occasionally, but you sort of really need to understand them, and you need to understand all of them. There's sort of a huge zoo of um, 
of things that you need to, to understand. And, and so when I say understand, you don't necessarily need to do a really good job, but you do need to not make gross errors. And if you're uncertain, you need to be able to say, oh, I'm uncertain in this situation, right? So, so for example, you know, if I'm uncertain about a, a vehicle's velocity, well, I should give it more, more room, right? Mm -hmm. I, should, I should back off. And so there's that, that, you know, I think getting good uncertainties out of our models um, is something that we haven't you know, the community hasn't focused on very much. But isn't it a part because those edge cases, um, there's not enough cars that have traveled enough and not enough data and not enough mapping, you know, mapping data yet to combine that? Or is that not it? Is it more about just actually actually having the, the, the algorithms in working time rather than the actual available visual data? Uh, I think, I mean, I think you're starting to see, I mean, I think Waymo now probably have, um, you know, those millions of miles. And I think... Uh, you can actually crack, you know, you can rack up a lot of miles quite but quickly those are, with but, a fleet. Right? right, but those are each, like, so Waymo has their data, Zoox right. has their data, and Autonomy has their data, Sea Machines has their data, Map, Mapillary has their data, mm. and everybody else in between. So there's, there's not many Switzerlands there as far as data. So in order right. for your 1% to succeed, eventually, you know, it, it depends on the amount of time it'll take you to get the coverage mm -hmm. to train the algorithms to, to deliver uh, a safe driving. Yeah, and I, I think simulation has to be part of that mix okay. as well. Right? So and how are you yeah. integrating the simulation to do that? So I think, um, yeah, so, I, yeah, so I, I think in many ways. So I think one is you can actually um, you know, simulate cameras mm -hmm. and radars and LIDARs, and uh, you can actually train and test off that. You can also run you know, prediction and planning in the loop, actually in a simulated world. And yeah, you can really sort of stress test um, all of those edge cases, right? So that's a super important part of the, part of the, the puzzle. And that's something where you... You don't need all those miles. It's a uh, you need to create the content. You need to build the systems. It's an engineering problem. It's soluble, I think. Right. Um, okay. And when will that be that part of it that you're worried about be solved? Which is that second part of that question. It, I don't think it will ever be fully solved. It's going to be just a long um, sort of never knocking down of these issues, right? So, okay. so, so I think you know and people have this this idea that oh there'll be a date and oh everything's autonomous and it's perfect. Right. It's just not that's not how it's going to be, right? It's going to be this. Um, it will get to a point where it's you know good enough. I think in some uh, certain areas and certain what they call ODDs. So that's a, those are kind of um, situations that you encounter, and you'll be sort of you know in increasing your areas, increasing your ODDs over time. Um, Got it, Sad. Um, you know, I think l like was saying, uh, the idea is we're not going to have everything autonomous at a certain date, but <coughs> if you look around. Um, you know, cars and, you know, human drivers always, like, have accidents all the time, but, you know, it's not reported as much as, like, when Uber crashes or, like, when, uh, you know, the autonomous car Uber crashes or, like, the t t autonomous Tesla crashes. Uh, that's because, like, you know, we're okay with human making an error and not, like, a machine, and that's totally understandable. I think the biggest challenge for us, you know, at, you know and the way we see it at see machines is, you know, the hum how human drives, they really heavily rely on their, you know, eyes and vision uh, and this is what you know our sensors and I totally agree with Professor X and so on so like you know really the vision is going to be the key to having like uh, a good drive not like uh, maybe not collision free drive but you know, a really like good approach because this is how humans do it but the thing is going to be like also the the camera as itself because like with the eye this is like one of our most precious like sensors as humans we blink like 20 times uh, a minute so we're really protecting and, and you know, doing as much as possible to keep our eyes like as um, efficient as possible. So I think that's what's you know going to really make um, the autonomous vehicles feel better if we have like better cars that you know behave better that have better sensors. How about in boat scenarios? So uh, uh, you know the New York Harbor. I was in a meeting the other day that looked out at you know a hundred boats and and uh, different sizes and shapes and going different directions. What is, what's the difference challenge that you think is is most difficult today? That's different from uh, vehicle uh, cars, or is it exactly the same? So um, it's it's not exactly the same. There's a lot of similarities between the the two two uh, areas. Uh, the what's different is like if we let's say we rely on the the cameras that what we're going to need is to know how far the other ships are 
but also to have an idea of the size just from the vision. So if we're using radar and LIDAR, for example, that's, that's something that we can easily do because like the people said on the panel before, like, you know, basically you have a range and like you have a distance and an angle so you know where your points are. But the moment you, you know, try to, to have vision uh, as much as possible, that means that you know, a big ship you know, might look really small on your uh, camera feed because of, you know, because of the distance. But, uh, and the rules of way, like who gets to go first in the ocean and the sea, really heavily relies on the size of your ship, you know, where you're heading and where you're coming from, and if you like, have the right of way. So that's, that's kind of the difference. There's no red lights, but basically, <laughs> you know, there's, you know, you, you need to let go if, if the a, a ship is bigger than you, has different speed, if you're being taken over and things like that. It's also kind of nice because in cars, if you hit, hit a little nick or a slight bump into another car, everybody's upset. In the boat business, there are these big bumpers, so if you bounce off the side of the, the, the dock, it's actually okay. Yeah, well, we try not to bump anyway. Of course, because of course. Like, <laughs> yeah, because like, there's, uh, there's also, you know, uh, a bump, for example, for a car is basically a dent in your car that you can go and fix. A bump in a boat might, you know, sink the boat. So yeah, no, I mean, I, I meant like, no, yes. <laughs> Keep me honest, thank you. Okay, but on that point, which is great, uh, and we'll come back to your other two that you memorized, uh, Oscar, um, there's a, the intention. And so well, I talk to a lot of uh, companies now, and there's kind of a trend, there's, and we're going to talk more about this later today, um, the closed system versus the open system. And so you guys building closed environments, there's a lot of companies that say, hey, we're going to build the behavioral cognitive intention layer because we're uh, neuro and cognitive scientists, and we, we know that. For the example of when you come to a four-way intersection, and you've got a dog, and uh, a dog walker, you've got a family on one corner, you've got four cars, and they all come at the same time. Who goes first? Will you guys be building the full stack internally and not want to license anybody else's great technology? Or do you think you'll uh, be licensing others and layering it in to your autonomous solutions? Um, so, so we think that um, you should be building the whole stack, essentially. So we're not trying to build a vehicle. We're not trying to build sensors. We're not. We're not looking into the hardware. Mm -hmm. We're also. We would also consider, you know, mapping partners, um, because that's a very sort of tangible, generic asset. But when it comes to things like you mentioned, like intent, the interaction between uh, planning, perception, control, uh, we really view it as one system, and it needs to be optimized jointly, and you need to think about how that works together. So. Yeah. Is it because it, is it a control issue uh, to do that? I mean, if you think of you know the <coughs> the Google versus others. Right. I mean, Google's built more on open infrastructure, and everybody's going to have layers that go into it, and and services they might own certain pieces of right. it. But um, I I is it a risk of the safety, or is it more of a business decision? Um, I think it's a little bit of both. I mean, okay. so for example, when we launched, um, you know, we have a. a a service in Singapore now mm -hmm. you can go and, and ride in our cars. And one thing we notice is that it's not enough to drive safely. Like you need to drive in a way that sort of people expect you to drive. So otherwise people just, they, they get nervous and they get, you know, sick, you know, seasick essentially because they, the car's not driving the way they expect a human driver to drive. So even though you're completely safe, you might even be safer. You're not behaving the way the passenger expect right so so they are you don't have happy, happy customers they have right. a bad product so, so so you know so that's something that uh, is, is materializes at the very end but the whole stack needs to be you know you re need to reconsider the whole stack to really address that problem makes sense james what do you think about that topic yes i think it's uh, self-driving is this uniquely sort of um integrated product right so it's and, and there's not even agreement on you know what sensors you have at the end, right? right? And, and so actually, and it's all the way from the business model back, right? So if your business model is selling vehicles to end consumers, um, there are sort of uh, economic constraints that actually determine you know what sensors you can have. If you're going to go a ride-sharing model, there's a, there's a different constraints, and so that that then defines the architecture, that defines how um, uh, you know the planner, the prediction, the perception works, and everything else. So it, so I think it's just too early to commoditize any of those pieces because they're too sort of unique in some sense, right? Like you build the thing you need to do and also there's, there's not sort of clear yet sort of boundaries between those systems. I think the industry is at the point where we're still working out what those boundaries are and, and how you actually you know, define them. And so um, I think it's a little bit like, well, I'm trying to think of a, of a 
a good analogy, which I can't, can't think of right now. If, but. if it pops in your head, you can, we can come back. But yeah. it makes sense. Saad, what do you think? Um, so for us, it's, it's, it's a little bit different. Um, it's, we're, we're in the middle between two really critical choices. For example, at Sea Machines, um, we don't want to be like efficient experts for the ocean. Uh, but what we want to be is to really like be able to you know drive any boat uh, in any condition. So uh, with that uh, in mind, we so we we'll would be happy like to collaborate with any um, uh, other company uh, or, also, or research centers uh, to provide us with, for example, the the sensing and so on. However, like our clients um, have a very different approach because like. When you look at the you know the maritime industry, they heavily rely on uh, okay, this is like you know, certified by this entity and so on. So like they're not looking for something that's open source. The moment you mention open source, everybody's like you know freaking out. So we try to avoid that. Um, so so what we're doing now is basically uh, leveraging uh, the best of both worlds. You know, trying to build uh, as many things in house as possible. But also seeing and like what's uh, what's out there, and see if we can like contribute to like if it's an open source project or something like contribute to it, and then also like get uh, you know try to have it in um, in the helm of like steam machines. So like we also provide that as a guarantee for our clients in the future. Got it. So let me give a scenario. Let's say all three of you have. Um, you know, 10,000 cars or boats operating uh, today, and you just launched today. Well, tonight, when you're sleeping, what would be the biggest thing that would, you know, keep you up at night and worry? What's the, where, where, where is the piece of the puzzle uh, that you would worry the most about, technically? Um, okay, let's, let me go first for this one. So I think uh, the, the trouble really would, would be if, um, if there is any case that we totally missed, um, so because the the good thing about again the good thing about like the maritime rules is like they're really well defined. So uh, for the the corex by the coast guards basically tell you this is all the situation that exists and this is how you uh, really make it work. So what I'd be really afraid of is something that just turns off. Like you have a ship which is sailing and then like the power is cut and then nobody is capable of like turning that back on. Uh, hopefully, you know, right now we have like fail safes uh, if this happens. So like this, this, another support vessel can come in and like, you know, um, run everything back uh, on track. But uh, if we have, uh, like you said, 10,000 vehicles around and we have a massive uh, drop off, which which is we're not planning for that to ever happen to us because not our all of our vessels are connected. But uh, if that ever happens, I think the, that's going to be big. But it's it's going to be similar if there is like a plague that you know hits all sailors at one time. Well, that you know really rare, but right. it might happen. Got it, James Oscar. Um, so yeah, I kind of dispute the the question. I think so. I think sure. um, I like that. You, you know, before you get to ten thousand, you're going to have one thousand. Before you get to one thousand, mm -hmm. you have hundred. Before hundred, you have ten. And so at no point, I think, will you be um, surprised, or right? I think we won't be doing our jobs well if we are, right? right. So we'll actually have a really good sense of uh, the capabilities and, um, you know, we'll have been spent many years, like, ironing out the... the yeah, I think that totally makes sense. So hypothesize. You've gone through the, right. the one car, the 10 car, the 100, the 5,000. Right. Now you're at 10,000. And you've, you've, you've hashed through all these great uh, trial and error and edge cases and you're fine-tuning. What, uh, you know, thinking about it a different way, in two years, what's going to keep you up at night technically? Obviously, you want to build a fail-safe si situation, but where's that, you know, that concern, which everybody's worried about, is giving up control to trust? Um, and so what would, from the technical, I like asking the question because it's, you guys are the ones building it. And what keeps you up at night, well, keep me up at night. <laughs> um, so if looking at it from that perspective. <laughs> Hi, tough questions. I like tough questions, guys. I didn't email you this one. <laughs> well, um, well, I think, okay, so I mean, in the long run, um, so all these uh, sort of engineering problems that we're wrestling with right now, um, I think will we'll be solved. And like James say, we're going to roll them out slowly but surely. Mm -hmm. uh, and, the, and, and there will be backup systems. And one of the thing, nice things about operating an autonomous taxi service is that you can always have teleoperation. You can always have humans sort of almost in the loop, right? So if something goes wrong, 
you can you can step in and try to help mm-hmm. a little bit, right? So I'm not. I wouldn't be so worried about. I think safety uh, will be solved fairly soon and fairly reliably. The the bigger problem is. Uh, um, I mean, the, the ultimate problem is the interaction with other right with okay. other vi- uh, vehicles, right? So when you need to merge into a lane of dense traffic, and you really need to like do that communication with your own car. You need to nudge in a little bit. You need to maybe even look over and see someone wink and like, you know, under, understand that interaction. So our car is going to wink to each other? Well, if there's a human drivers in the... Well, what if there's no human drivers? So will, when will the cars wink to each other? I think that'll happen. Well, I mean, that, that's, a, that's an easier problem, right? Because you can formalize that protocol. But when there's a bunch of human drivers in the loop, uh, you get into this uh, almost a general AI problem yeah. where you have to like be a fully autonomous robot. And that's... Um, as it's really, really I, I agree. I was driving in uh, Silicon Valley down 101, and, and I actually saw an autonomous test car, and it was not driving the same way as the other humans were driving. And I, was, I realized that, oh, I'm going to have to act differently in this in-between crossover when we have a mixture of humans and autonomous cars, because I actually was wor- more worried about that car because of the behavior than a drunk person driving. And, and, I, and, and that instantly popped in my head. It's like, well, that's, it's not 20 years or 30 years when a majority of cars might be autonomous. It's this in-between in the next couple of years where the interaction is an unknown. And not many people, obviously, in our audience, we can tell because of the cameras that are all over the car. Um, but n- most people wouldn't know the difference. Yeah, and I actually think, I was thinking about that the other night. Um, I actually think people will very soon realize that autonomous vehicles will always be uh, err on the side of caution. Mm-hmm. So you can have a situation like in, in Boston where there's kind of a brutal culture in, the, in traffic. <laughs> people will just just basically screw the autonomous cars over. They'll just drive and they know that the car will stop. Oh, they're going to test it? You mean they're going like, to play I, chicken I, I with the car that, to see what it does? I think, I think it won't be long before you, you know that the autonomous vehicles are, are going to be avoid you know, accidents at every cost. So you can just exploit that, right? You can just say... I know that car is drive driven by a robot. It's like so Fro- just, it's like Frogger, the game going across. Right. You, you can play with yeah, it. Yeah, you can just you can just go. <laughs> and uh, I think yeah, that's something we're gonna have to really think about how to negotiate that. James, you were gonna say something. What do you think? I, I was actually I was gonna say exactly Oscar's point. So I think uh, yeah, we'll, we'll very soon see people you know cutting up autonomous cars. Uh, you know, uh, yeah, autonomous. Just for kicks to see what happens. No, it sounds kind of dangerous. It's like oh, I'm in a rush. Oh, okay. It's an autonomous yes. car. I don't care. You know, like you know, you, you're, you'll be at the stop sign first, and they'll just you know, cut you off. <laughs> it's kind of like the rental car industry many years ago used to have Hertz or the labels on the cars and they'd mm-hmm. go into bad areas and something would happen and now they took it all off. So we're going to hide it so nobody knows right. because that game will happen. Got it. Um, so the conversation in the earlier panel, uh, radar, LIDAR versus commoditized cameras. Um, what's the most valuable visual data for each of you today um, out of the three? Um, and which will one win in, in five years, meaning majority uh, or of cars will only have one, or will it always be a combination? Um, so I don't want to go into too much detail on, on which one is most valuable for us right now. Okay. Um, but I would be very surprised if, if we wouldn't keep using all, all of the above. And there's also some really interesting work. I was talking to an Israeli startup that do like a, like a dense solid state super LiDAR, basically. So you get an image, but it's it's now uh, every pixel is uh, distance and velocity, densely, right? So, I mean, there's, I think we'll have the, the three sensors we have, uh, modalities we have today, but there'll be, there'll be more. Um. Yeah, I, mean, I think you may see even, even more modalities, right? Uh, actually, not less. Great, um, such as? Uh, I will encourage you to look at the electromagnetic, electromagnetic spectrum and see which bits are unused but that's that there, that's there the of, that's the i have a lot of ideas but i can't tell you <laughs> there, um, there are a bunch of startups in that space right? yeah yeah so, sure and yeah on the um yeah there's like ecodyne is a big radar mm-hmm. israeli radar company um i think they just took a big, big bunch of funding from bill gates and mm-hmm. suddenly getting some interest and then innovis which is a, a lidar startup as well um so yeah i think all three will be important and i would actually add you know the map as another Right. Modality. People don't often think of it as a modality. It's actually, it is, right? It Absolutely. Has its own, um, own error cases, and, um, but also is very useful as well. So right. historical map maps and uh, other visual maps in addition to the real-time uh, visual data that the car is capturing. 
yeah, it's some kind of dense geometry plus semantics uh, of the world, right? And so that like the be, example I had in my keynote this morning with, with Mapillary, putting their crowdsourced visual data together. Right, and, and the challenge there, I think, for a map startup is um, every company right now has kind of their own way of dealing with maps mm -hmm. and their own needs as well. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, but, uh, but I definitely think, yeah, there's, there's an opportunity there. Um, okay. Uh, Saad, do you have anything to add to that question, or should I move on to other questions? No, I think, well, at least, uh, I think fusion of data is going to be, like, you know, um, necessary, at, you know, at all points. Because, uh, again, going back to the ocean, uh, the moment, uh, like, you know, all, every single sailor uses, like, uh, his eyes, but also uses a bunch of other sensors that are on board already, you know, to whether look at the echo sounder to know the depth, you know, where he's going, or uh, a chart uh, to to have an idea of what, where he's heading at, or like a radar to see what's uh, what's ahead, like far ahead that he cannot see. So um, the fusion is going to be necessary, but you know the it's it's only going to really make sense that you know if the vision uh, is there, if the computer vision is like really uh, almost the, the same quality as we have with uh, with our eyes. Uh, and we're thinking also like if we're gonna come to a port and try to dock your your, your ship or your boat, that's gonna be a challenge. You know, if you do if you try to do it with you know a radar or anything, like then it's really just gonna be back to lidar, uh, lidars and the cameras. So, are any questions from the audience? As I have more questions here, we'll get the mics walking around. Raise your hand. Uh, we've got about five minutes left of this panel. There's a question up here in the front, and mention who you are. Um, Ashur Bey, come on. Um, my question is about the uh, body language. Uh, there is a lot of uh, unspoken body language that takes place between uh, humans, uh, in pedestrians, as well as uh, the, the drivers. When there's an AI driving uh, uh, an autonomous car, he cannot uh, wink, nod, uh, no, you go first, no, you go first, that type of stuff. So how are you going to manage that body, unspoken body language that is responsible for a lot of uh, city driving uh, when there's an autonomous car that just goes by the rules and doesn't understand uh, the wink, the nod, uh, or the hand gestures. Who wants to take that? Yeah, so I, I agree with you. I think there's um, actually that unspoken nonverbal communication is very important. And actually that's something that the Zoox is thinking about you know, quite seriously. Um, I can't say too much, but... Um, there are, you know, you can imagine various ways of, of doing it, right? Where you can have, you know, screens and lights and, and other things. Now, I, I think the challenge there is that the sort of there, there doesn't exist this sort of uh, unified language. So, you know, getting people to understand exactly what you mean is, I think, um, yeah, an, a question. Right. But I, I, I agree with the, the premise definitely. Any other questions in the audience? All right, don't be shy. You know the okay. There you go. Actually, just, just a comment to jump on to that um, question um, and a previous comment about uh, autonomous cars uh, slowing, slowing things down and perhaps not. But in cities um, where there are a lot of pedestrians and they negotiate that, especially in New York, um, that actually might be a point of slowness in some ways because they have to, um, you know, if cars don't go, pedestrians, pedestrians will just keep going. Um, and if they're con very conservative, that might be an issue there. So um, just your thoughts on, um, I guess, the difficulties of self-driving in a dense um, urban environment versus, you know, uh, you know, more like the 101 in Silicon Valley. Yeah, I think, um, as I said earlier, I think that's, that is a real risk, right? So if the, the humans will sort of exploit the version of the AI that's that's running the car and try and, try and game it, basically. Uh, and I totally think we need to tune our algorithms depending on, on the city we deploy in. So if we are in really dense urban areas, we just need to basically uh, be a little bit more aggressive and, and maybe you know keep going very slow, but actually start driving slowly towards the um, you know crosswalk and, and think about that. Um, You're talking about we the humans or we the cars? The, we the self-driving cars. We, we who design the self-driving cars. Yeah. We, um, the designers of the computer yeah. vision that designs the right. car that drives and sees <laughs> like, yes, it doesn't hit that, the path cut. That's what I mean, yeah. Right. And so I, the, and the I, proverbial we is many layers of we. It's true, yeah. yeah that's good, actually. And, and I think, um, I mean, and that's actually gets into another point of, of uh, sort of end-to-end -end learning versus formal logic. So at some point you want to, there's this debate going on in the community, like, do you want to, 
uh, you know, comma.ai famously tried to uh, go end to end, right? So all the way from sensor data to, to controls essentially, right? Uh, at Newton, we, we don't believe in that. We, we believe that you should have formal logic and uh, to actually decide, make, make the decisions on, on how you're moving, right? So you can have learning all you want in, elsewhere in the system. And I think having formal logic will actually help tune to these explicit conditions, right? So when you go to Barcelona, you know, you need to basically change the rule book, the weights a little bit in that. And having that be explicit is quite useful, I think. Great. Any other questions out there? Uh, great, there's two more, go. Uh, Brian Miner with Envision.ai. A question for the voter guy, C-Machines. I'm a voter myself. I'm curious, how do you handle issues like depth, the water, currents, weather, wave conditions? Is that a big problem with your machine learning, or is it not? Yeah, so um, it is a, a problem. It's not a huge problem problem or a showstopper for us um, because there is um, enough data that will you know uh, enables us to understand what's uh, what's around the, the depth and so on basically if if you know that like you know you're going to an area where there's shallow waters you know you are trying to make sure that you know all these like shallow water areas are like, no-go zones so you try to avoid them uh, just like uh, a human you know does when he looks at the chart um, when uh, the, the more interesting part is, you know, when there is the harsh conditions, when, you know, there's, sea, exactly, when there's, like, a lot of waves, uh, when the sea state is, like, three or four, how do you, like, really behave uh, in that case? So for that, um, our challenge that we're working on still is how do we understand where the waves are coming from uh, so we can have, like, this um, automatic heading to, like, fight the waves and, like, you know, always be um, upside right. Uh, so... Um, so that's, you know, that's something that we call uh, auto seamanship. Uh, it's something we're still working on, uh, but, you know, yeah, we definitely, like, uh, it's, it's a challenge that, you know, we're uh, confident that we're going to uh, overtake. One more quick question, then we're going to move on. Yes. Uh, Dave Turetsky from Carnegie Mellon. So I think the right term to use when, when people um, take advantage of these robot cars is, is bullying, right? You're bullying the robot car. Um, by aggressively moving in front of it, say. And now, what I, want, what I want to ask you about is, when you have these cars with all this video and LiDAR data, they're very able to gather data on your behavior as a human driver. Mm -hmm. And so, what do you think about the idea that if I drive like a jerk uh, enough, then um, I get a ticket in the mail for being a jerk, right? Because all these robot cars have said, hey, you know, this guy cut me off. And he, you know, changed lanes aggressively, and he, you know, he did all this stuff to me, and I feel bad about it. And um, sure, you know, absolutely, absolutely. Even better, that car could warn the next car that that same guy that cut him off last week is approaching him, huh? Yeah. So we may end up being better drivers because we're we're observed much more frequently than. I mean, police don't give you tickets for being a jerk unless you cause an accident these days, right? But that might change. You want to add to that side? Yeah, I think a solution to that, like you train your cars, autonomous cars, to drive in Boston, and then like you know, you you know, the car is gonna be driving exactly like the same way. So you know, you're gonna, it's gonna cut <laughs> off the, the, the exact. So there's gonna be, uh, you can choose when you buy a car. Yeah. Do you want it to drive like a Boston driver, New York driver, exactly. or a Texan driver? Yes. Oh, I love it. It's kind of like going to rental, uh, rent a car rental and getting the pickup with the shotgun, or getting the uh, the sports Smart. car. Ah, okay, on that, we're going to end with one question from each, uh, that I have from these guys and then move right along. So we talked earlier today or in my keynote was about the war of the camera. There's also another war. It's the war to recruit the best computer vision and deep learning people, okay? There's dozens, if not many more, companies doing similar or different things than the three on this stage. So in one sentence, how do you convince that person to join you and not your, uh, another company out there? <laughs> I mean, Did I scare you? I didn't email you that one either, did I, Oscar? <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think a lot of people are just attracted to the, the Zooks vision. Right? What's so, in one sentence? So, so, so the fact we want to, we really want to be the first sort of level four uh, driving startups, that means fully autonomous, and um, yeah, we, we want to actually, you know, completely redesign cars, right? So they're not going to be cars anymore, they're going to be robots, and you know, when we show people what we've done, that's a big selling point. Not it doesn't work all the time, of course, but um, it does work sometimes. Okay, Saad, one sentence. I think uh, that's going to be a question. Look at the, 
look at the picture of the Earth from the Moon and see well, you know what what do you see? You, you know you see seventy percent of the Earth, which is water, and this is where we're um, playing. And you know, join us if you want to be like the big player, seventy percent on Earth. All right, Oscar, you're ready. <laughs> Are you ready now? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, no, uh, um, so Newtonum is the, the startup that has uh, by far c come the furthest in terms of actually deploying on public road with, with real drivers, real passengers, uh, getting real data. So um, I think we have a, a very good shot at, at making it all the way. Fantastic. Oscar, James, Saad, thank you very much. Round of applause for these guys. Appreciate it.